anything about them up to this point. Meaning, a, a pastor, you know, he'll have a godly sons just describe God into the position simply being Semitism. It's not an everyday word. He's being sent to the you know, knows that their kids aren't perfect, so it's a foolish thing to sit there and think that, that somebody else's kids should be perfect. Just because Titus chapter 1, as I left thee in Crete, that thou shouldest set in order the things that are wanting, and ordain elders in every city as I had appointed thee. If any be blameless, the husband of one wife, having faithful children, not accused of riot or unruly. <laughs> so what does this mean here at the end where it's saying, having faithful children, not accused of riot or unruly? Well, what is that? Let's just take a minute and break this down here. Faithful children. Now, is it hard? Is it is it is it really hard for a child who's growing up in a godly home to be considered faithful? You know, unless they just you know go completely off the rails. I mean, they're you know they're pat, they're getting their handkerchief and they're putting the bread and the cheese and a, and a change of underwear and putting it on their stick and running away. You know, they're, they're headed for the hills. They're going to go. You know, they're going to go train hopping or something across. You know. Most kids, unless they are really bad in, a, in a somebody's house, you know, they're faithful just right. to begin with. I mean, it's not, I don't know that anyone would say that about any of my kids, like, would question whether one of my kids is faithful. I wouldn't question that how faithful anyone's kids are in this room. But is that really, is that the standard here, to have faithful children when they're in the home? Because that's kind of a given, don't you think? Right. That kids that are under, under mom and dad, that they're being ruled over, that they have a parent there cracking down on them. Can you really credit the kids for being faithful? Now, it's great that they are, that they don't give mom and dad a hard time. But I think what this is, replying to, uh, is referring to here is talking about children who are out of the home, children who have grown up. Okay? Now, not everybody's probably going to agree with me on this, but this is my interpretation. You know, and this isn't something that you know, people have to, we have to get in a big hubbaloo about. All right? This is my interpretation of it. And it's, you know, I could be, I'm open to correction on it. But I believe what it's talking about here is having faithful children, you know, not accused of riot or unruly. Now, those are not sins that are that children are prone to. Right. And we're going to prove that here in a minute. Okay? <clears throat> so if you would, keep something in Titus, but go over to 1 Timothy 3. 1, time, 1 Timothy 3. So he's saying here, look, they have to have these, these uh, elders that he wants ordained in every city have to have faithful children. And what I believe he's referring to is children that are going... To continue on, you know, living for the Lord. Now, of course, it means faithful in their house as well. Okay, of course, it means you know you can't have a child at home who's slapping mom and calling the dad names and can't you can't you can't get him under control. You know, and we're going to get more into that. Okay, but I believe it's important that they have faithful children or ch children that will become you know be proven faithful in time. <clears throat> so it says in Proverbs twenty-two verse six. Train up in a child the way he should go, and when he is old, he will not depart from it. You know, and anyone, you know, and it goes for anybody. You know, this is a promise that is for everybody, not just the man of God. Amen. That if you train your child correctly, you know, you have this promise that when they are old, they are not going to depart from it. What are they going to be? They're going to be faithful children, faithful to the Lord. And that's why I think 1 Timothy 3 is more one that would apply to younger children that are in the home. So he says in 1 Timothy 3, verse 4, one that ruleth well his own house, having his children in subjection with all gravity. Now, I know I talked about this recently, but again, what does it mean to have your children in subjection? Does that mean that they never step out of line? Or does it mean that when they step out of line, you get them in subjection with all gravity? It means when they step out of line, because again, all kids are going to mess up to some degree or another. They're going to make mistakes. They're going to do dumb things. And what it's saying here that it's in order to be the pastor, when that happens, not if, when it happens, when kids get out of line, he has to rein them in. He has to get them in subjection with all gravity. He has to take it seriously and, and deal with it. Because here's, the, and I'll, tell, I'll just be perfectly candid with you right now. If, if having perfect children is the qualification for the pastorate, I quit. I don't want anything to do with it because my kids aren't perfect. And, and I don't want I don't want to put that on my kids. You must be perfect right. yeah. for dad's sake. Correct. It's not it's unrealistic. Yeah. Nobody's gonna fill the pulpit at that point because nobody has perfect kids. 
The difference is, is that is whether or not that person has their imperfect children in subjection with all gravity. So there's a difference there between having the perfect child and having a child in subjection with all gravity. Now I will say, children can disqualify a pastor or a deacon in one of two ways. And this, again, this is my understanding of it. And I, you know, again, I'm open for anybody to say, to talk to me about it. <laughs> and, it's, and we can have a discussion. But one, obviously I, I believe would be by not being kept in subjection when living at home. If, if the pastor's kids are just running roughshod and just causing a ruckus and being just, you know, getting into sin and doing bad things, and the pastor's kind of, yeah, well, you know, the kids. What am I supposed to do? You know, and they just said, well, nobody's perfect. And just let them go about their way. Then, yeah, we'd have a problem, wouldn't we? Then we'd have to say, sorry, you're not qualified because you don't have them in subjection with all gravity. But, you know, when the pastor or the deacon hears about it, their kids acting up or doing something wrong, and he cracks down on them, you know what that makes them? It makes them qualified. Amen. Because that's the qualification in Scripture. To have them in subjection. <clears throat> That's one way a child, I believe, could disqualify a pastor, is if he did not take the time to bring them into subjection and keep them in subjection, and when they get out of line, get them in subjection. Another way, I believe, and this is kind of a gray area, okay? This is kind of an area where I think, and I'll get into, well, let me just say, it's kind of a gray area, okay? Because I think there's other things that have to be taken into consideration, okay? But... Another way children, I believe, can disqualify a pastor or a deacon, because again, it's a qualification for a deacon, is by not having faithful adult children. Okay? I believe that, and, and I've heard pastors say this, and I, you know, I'm a little, I really don't, not sure I really agree with this, this idea that as long as they're in subjection and faithful in the home, but as soon as they're out of the home and they live however they want, that, that, I'm, that, that doesn't apply. I, I'm not sure that I agree with that. I believe that if you have, if a pastor or a deacon raises children that go out and go to the world and live for the devil and have nothing to do with church, that man has failed. Because what's the promise? That if you train up a child the way in which, which he shall go, when he is old, he shall not depart from it. He will not depart from it. So if you have somebody whose child is departing from the faith, is not faithful, and is going out and living a wicked life, you have to ask yourself, did they train them up the way they ought to have? <clears throat> So that's one way I believe that if, if there's two ways for children to disqualify a pastor or a deacon. By not having them subjection, which he's going to need to do because children are not perfect, or when they're older, having failed to raise them the right way to where now they do go astray. And here's why I say that. 1 Timothy 1, did you keep something there? Look at verse 5, or excuse me, verse 6. If any be blameless, the husband of one wife, having faithful children, not accused of riot or unruly. Okay? These children cannot be accused. And by the way, accused doesn't just mean somebody said that about them. It means it's a true accusation. Because if that were the, if that were the qualification, then every reprobate out there could just accuse every pastor and get disqualified. Right. Well, his children were accused. Yeah, but was it true? That's what it's referring to here. And it, it's, it's silly when we have to get that clear. Like, we really have to take the time to explain something as simple as that. But there's people out there that I've heard say, well, they were accused. I've heard people be, you know... These, these kids are accused, therefore disqualified. And that's a whole other can of worms that I don't want to open up again. But here's the thing. He says he's not accused of riot or unruly. And let's just take a minute and, and figure out what this word riot means. Okay? Because let me just go on and say this. Riot is, you know, riotous living, which is what it's referring to, is a grown-up sin. And so go over to 1 Peter chapter 4. 1 Peter chapter 4. Let's look at this word, riot, riotous you're going to 1 Peter 4. The Bible says in Proverbs 23, verse 20, Be not among wine bibbers, among riotous eaters of flesh. For the drunkard and the glutton shall come to poverty. These are grown-up sins. Right. You know, I don't come home from, from work at the end of the day and go to my son and say, Were you a good boy or were you riotous today? Were you out there with those riotous eaters of flesh? <laughs> were you out being a drunkard and a glutton and a wine bibber, son? No, because it's not even possible for him. I mean, the kid can't hardly even get his shoes on. He can get out the front door on his own. Like he's going to go find some bar. We're going to find him down at, you know, Hooters or something. Little Corbin John pulled up to the, to the bar with a mug and a big old thing of wings in his hands. Checking out all the chicks. That's not what's going on. Right. 
Because it's a child. And this is talking about, I believe this is referring to an adult sin. Yeah. Not accused of riot or unruly. Unruly just means not, you know, not receiving correction, not receiving reproof. Not, you can't rule them. They, can't, they won't receive correction. Okay? But let's focus on the riot. Verse Peter 4, where you are, look at verse 3. For the time past of our life may suffice us to have wrought the will of the Gentiles when we walked in lasciviousness, lusts, excess of wine, revelings, banquetings, and being an abominable idolatries. Wherein they think it strange that ye run not with them to the same excess of riot. So again, this, this lascivious life, this life of lust and excess of wine, revelings, banquetings, abominable idolatries, these aren't things that children get involved with. You know, I'm sure there's an exception to every rule. You know, there's the kid in Cambodia who's smoking, like, I don't remember if anybody remembers that. You know, he's toting the AK, smoking the pack a day, you know, or whatever. He's this 12 year old, but anyway, I don't know where I'm going with that. But look, folks, these are adult sins. And what do they call it? The, the, they think it's strange in verse 4 that you run not with them to the same excess of riot. Riotous living is all these things. Go over to Luke chapter 15. I think this is one of the most clearest examples of it. The Bible says in Proverbs 28, Whoso keepeth the law is a wise son. Whoso keepeth it, he's faithful. He continues on in the things that he's been taught as a grown man, as an adult, when he's out on his own. Whoso keepeth the law is a wise son, but he that is a companion of riotous men shameth his father. It's riotous men, men that are involved in being a wine bibber, being a glutton, being a riotous eater of flesh, a drunkard, these things. That's the guy that brings shame to his father. Not the little kid who's just sassing his mom. That's not a rioter. Now, my son's not a you know, riotous when he does that. Look at Luke 15, verse 11. It, and he said... Of course, it's the story of the prodigal son. A certain man had two sons, and the younger of them said to his father, Father, give me the portion of the goods that falleth to me. And he divided unto them his living. And not many days after, the younger son gathered all together and took his journey to a far country. And there he wasted his substance. With what? With riotous living. Look, riotous living takes substance. you got to have money if you want to do it. You have to have money if you want to go out and carouse and drink and eat to all these excesses. That, that all takes a substance. That's riotous living. <clears throat> so again, you know, first, or Titus chapter 1, one way that we can be disqualified as pastors or deacons is when our, our children are not faithful, and then we hear a report that they're riotous and that they're unruly. Now again, a bit of a gray area here. And, and, and this is, I've never run, we've never had to really think about this and pray God that we never do. Is that, you know, if we have, like, our pastor, say, has a bunch of kids, you know, well, what if one of them goes astray and the rest of them grow up and be faithful? You know, and then people, and, and I bring all this up because it just lately it just seems like people are asking the question, well, when, at what point do we disqualify the pastor? And I just want to ask them, why are you on such a hair trigger to right. disqualify the pastor? Right. What do you care? Let's find out when we get there, if and when we have to. Meanwhile, instead of asking questions like that, maybe you should just spend your time praying for him. Amen. That's right. Because <clears throat> the man's under attack. You know, I failed to mention it in my announcements, and I'd rather not say it on the live stream. But even today, you know, he's, he's under attack. by you know, People are calling. I shouldn't even say it. We, I'll, I'll, if you're interested, I'll tell you after the service. I don't even want to say it online. So anyway. Sorry to bring that up and have you wondering for the rest of the service, but the point I'm making is this, is that, you know, there's ways to disqualify yourself as a pastor or deacon, but any real man of God who has any integrity in his body is going to know when that is. And, he, and you know what? You won't even have to ask him. He'll tell you, I've disqualified myself. Right. <clears throat> Only wicked guys are the ones that are going to sit there like, and, and truly just everyone in the room knows he's disqualified. He's like, well, I'm not going anywhere. You know? I know all my kids, but they're grown-ups now, so it doesn't matter how they live. I grew, I raised them right. No, you didn't, because otherwise the, the word of God isn't true. But let's move on in the sermon here. I thought that was, you know, a timely application for everything that's been taking place lately. And, you know, we need to, we need to consider these things. You know, Samuel, he had some sons. You know, maybe he didn't do everything he should have done for them, and, and they turned out bad. 
Okay, and we ask ourselves, you know, why did Samuel's sons turn out bad? And you know, again, I don't know. These guys aren't like Hop, Nye, and Phineas. Right. It's not the point where it's like they won't receive correction because the Lord intends to slay them. You know, they got into a position of power and it corrupted them. It doesn't necessarily mean that they're wicked, reprobate, evil, vile people. You know, there's a spectrum there. Right. And it's just like we always want to jump to this. Well, let's not do that because you know it could be that they're just don't have any self-control, that they, they don't have the integrity that Samuel led. Again, they're taking the position for granted because they didn't earn it like their father did. <clears throat> so it says in 1 Samuel chapter 8, verse 4, that all the elders of Israel gathered themselves together and came to Samuel unto Ramah. And you know, let me just say, this is just coming to mind while I'm reading, let me just say this. When they had a problem with the man of God, notice who they went to. The man of God. It says there, the elders of Israel gathered themselves together and came to Samuel. And said unto him, you know, they, they, they took it to him. You know, he wasn't the last one to be told or the last one to find out that somebody had a problem with his kids for what that's worth. Now, verse 5, it says, And he said unto him, Behold, thou art old, and thy sons walk not in thy ways. Now make us a king to judge us like all the nations. So here's the question. Why did Samuel's kids turn out bad? Well, I think part of that might have been in the fact that Samuel was very busy working for the Lord and neglected his duties at home. Right. That's a very real possibility. And that's happened in ministries before. You know, and, and I, I don't mean to besmirch or bring cast shade upon men of God that have passed on and aren't here to defend themselves, but it's a, it's a publicly known fact that Jack Hiles, who was a great man of God, who did great exploits for the Lord in his time, preached great sermons, and he had powerful soul winning, and to which I believe even to this day, many of us are indebted to him for the, 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 the things that he did. I'm not trying to lift him up, and, you know, but I want to give honor to whom honor is due. But the fact is, that man raised a very wicked son who did terrible things, adultery, I mean, just bad stories, and they're just, they're facts. Okay, it's not, just, that's not me. That's all been public for a long time. That's not me, you know, taking, you know, uh, raising an accusation against right. another without two or three witnesses. That is a public, that's on record. Right. <clears throat> so I'm, I'm being careful about how I go about that, but that is a fact. Now, why is that? How could such a great man of God do that? Well, how did Samuel end up raising two sons where as soon as they, you know, the, they, they went through the same process? You know, this nepotism that they fell into, it corrupted them, just like it did with Jack Kyle's son. Well, go back one chapter at the end there for Samuel chapter 7. And recall how it ended last week. Because you have to remember, Samuel's the only guy around. He's the only judge. The, you know, Eli's dead. Hophni and Phinehas were slain. It's not like there's just judges everywhere, left and right. It says in 1 Samuel 15, And Samuel judged Israel all the days of his life. You know, he was even when he was an old man, he's, he's just wearing himself out for the Lord. And it says that he went from year to year in circuit. Bethel and Gilgal and Mizpeh and Judge Israel and all those places. So every year he's just making this big circuit and guess what? There was no, you know, there was no want to get away seat on Southwest Airlines back then. Right. I mean, he's walking there, you know, maybe he gets a mule now and then, I don't know, but whatever way he's getting there, there's no freeway system. You say, well, it's only a few places here, but it's a long way. And when he's getting there, it's, it's a backlog of people. And it's not like he just gets there as one or two issues he's got to straighten out. He's going from year to year. It's probably like he's spending, I would get, it wouldn't surprise me if every time he gets there, he's spending three months in every one of these places. Straightening out everything, and then he's got to come back next year, and there's just a whole other backlog, you know, where he's got to hear this instance, and this case, and this. And, you know, he's the, he's the, he's the priest. He's sitting there making sacrifices and doing that priestly duty. He's very busy, and he's making a lot of rounds. And his return, it says in verse 17, was to Ramah, for there was his house. So, and he judged, and there he judged Israel, and there he built an altar unto the Lord. So, you know, from what we read in Scripture, you know, you read that, and then you move right into the next chapter, and you hear about his sons going back. And you start to wonder, well, maybe it's because he was away a little too much. Maybe he was gone, you know, trying to do something great for God, too, gone too much, you know, making himself too busy for the things of the Lord, that his family got neglected a little bit. You know, and unfortunately, it cost him in the end. So that's a very real possibility. And I, you know, I understand. You know, I, I 
for right now, I'm the only one that's really in a position to potentially do that one day as far as the ministry. But that should be a lesson to all of us as men that have families and that are raising children or will do so one day is that you don't want to get so busy with your job that you neglect your family because bad things happen. And I talked about that this last Sunday. But this is another great example of it, isn't it? Even a man as great as Samuel and all the exploits that he did and all, you know, all the wisdom that he had. And, the, and I mean, he's talking to the Lord, is, is speaking with him, using him in this great you know, transitional period, period in, in Israel's history. Even he messes up and has some bad kids, some bad, some bad apples. Not, not rotten to the core, just, you know, they, they fell. They, they messed up in this area. <clears throat> so maybe Samuel, if he hadn't been so busy with everybody else's problems, he would have seen his own and dealt with it a little bit more uh, clearly and decisively. But what's interesting about this text is that, you know, the people had this predetermined outcome in mind. You know, they come to him, it says they gathered themselves together, and they came to Samuel and to Ramah, and said, Behold, thou art old, and thy sons walk not in thy ways. Now make us a king, just like, uh, just like all the other nations. They had this predetermined idea. They already know how they want it to turn out. You know, they, they didn't say, so let's get a different judge in here. We appreciate your service, but let's continue on in God's system. Let's continue to do things the way God wants them done and just get another judge in here. They have something else in mind. They want a king so they can be like all the other nations. And really, I think this is a little bit of like blame shifting here. You know, they're, they're saying, well, it's not really, it's, we're not the problem. You know, it's not us. It's just the system that we have. You know, it's not working out for us. We want something different. And we have to understand at this point, Israel has a very long history of failing repeatedly under the system of the judges. I mean, you just go read through numbers, read through judges. You just see them, right? The judges rise up and they mess up and they, and then they, uh, you know, they fall. The judge comes along, delivers them. They serve them for 20, 40 years and then they fall. Then another judge has to come up. The same thing. It's just the cycle repeatedly over and over and over again. With Israel <clears throat> so they're saying well you know obviously it's it's not us it's God's system that's not working here when we just keep failing we have to keep getting these new judges and it's just not working let's get us a king <clears throat> now I love Samuel's response here they come to him and they just say hey your kids are not walking in your ways make us a king now it just this next phrase here in verse 6 shows you the heart of Samuel he says but the thing displeased Samuel when they said about his sons? No. Give us a king to judge us. Look, he heard the report about his sons, and he said, and he doesn't you don't see him objecting. You don't see him getting offended and, and saying, How dare you? You know, he, he probably said, Yeah, you know what? You're right. I can't. You're right. I, I failed there. He owns it. But what displeases him is the fact that they're saying, Give us a king. They don't. That, and Samuel prayed unto the Lord. That was his reaction. So it wasn't the rejection of his sons that upset Samuel, but it was the people's desire to be like all the nations. That's what displeased Samuel. Because he has a heart for God. Because he knows that in order to be he would look to and inquire of the Lord and get saved. So when he hears them saying, well, we want a king, you know, that's what, that's what grieves him. <clears throat> so Samuel being a real man of God, he was great <laughs> unto the Lord. How many times, more time in prayer, can't help but speak, he rejected thee, but they, <laughs> God said, they want Samuel out of there, they're done with this system, they're done doing things the way God wants them done. They want to do things like everybody else. God says, all right. Because we get this idea that we know better than God. That somehow we, we figured things out that, and then that the way God does things isn't right. It's our way things would be better. But that's a lie. Illusion. You're kidding yourself if that's what you think. So do you also. This is what that reminds me of. Don't be surprised, Samuel, that they're rejecting you. They reject me. Four, verse nine. Hearken not unto their voice. Excuse me. Hearken unto their voice. How be it? Yet protest solemnly against unto them, and show them the manner of the king that shall reign over them. So he's saying to give them what they want, but warn them about what they're going to get. 
asked of him a king. Verse 11, and he said, This will be the manner of the king that shall reign over you. He will take your sons and appoint them for himself, for his chariots and to be his horsemen, and some shall rand to be cannon fodder. That's what he's telling him here. You know, this is the draft. You know, this is conscription. They're just, just going to take him and he's going to go fight wars with, with your sons. And he will appoint him captains over thousands and captains over fifties and will set them on the ground. He's going to put them to work for him. That's what the king is going to do. And to reap his harvest and to make his instruments of war and his instruments of chariots. And he will take your daughters to be confectionaries and to be cooks and to be bakers. Not in your house. Not making something nice for you to eat, Dad. Your daughters are going to come make me food now. And he will take your fields and your vineyards and your olive yards, even the best of them, and give them to his servants. You now he's going to tax you. He's just going to grab land. He's going to take stuff that isn't his and use it for himself. That belong to you. He's going to rob you blind. And he will take the tenth of your seed and of your vineyards and give to his officers and to his servants. And he will make you men servants. And you know what? I'll take that. Now, give me two. No. But that's exactly what they said. That's exactly what they wanted. And he's saying, look, this is what you're going to get. And what does that teach us? That power corrupts. That power corrupts. When people get into power, it corrupts them. Now, did God's system, God, did God's system grant judges any of these rights? No, it didn't. Samuel didn't go around doing these things because that was not within his jurisdiction. God didn't give that to him. Right. The tabernacle and offer sacrifices and do his priestly duties and to, you know, judge between men. You know, what's right, what's wrong, to make judgment. That was his job as a judge. I mean, if Samuel had tried any of this, man, they would have run him up, you know, on a stake. He would have been, they would have lynched him. I mean, it would have been terrible if he tried any of this. But now he's saying, look, you're going to make a king. You want to be like the other nations. This is what's going to happen. You're going to put a man in power, and it's going to corrupt him to the core. And that's what we see happen. <clears throat> and it says in verse 18, And he shall cry out in that day because of your king, which you have cho he have chosen you. And the Lord will not hear you in that day. We'll say, well, that doesn't sound very nice. Yeah, it's because God's warning them now. But well, why won't God hear them in that day? Because he already warned them. And they went ahead and did it anyway. Look at verse 19. Nevertheless, the people refused to obey the voice of Samuel. I mean, this is their chance to say, you know what, Samuel? We change our minds. You're right. That doesn't sound like a very good deal. But they're just so rebellious because what? They didn't want to obey his voice, right? They're just so rebellious, so disobedient, and just so bent on having things their way that they don't care what it costs them. Even if it costs them their sons and their daughters and their fields and their property, and even their own selves. Make us slaves too, just as long as we get what we want. <clears throat> they said, nay, but we will have a king over us, that we may be like all the nations. We just want to fit in. We just want to be like everybody else. And our king may judge us and go out before us and fight our battles. Yeah, you know what? He might do those things, but who's he going to fight those battles with? With your kids, with the people, with, the, with your children. That's who he's going to fight the battles with. And Samuel heard all the words of the people and rehearsed them in the ears of the Lord. And the Lord said to Samuel, Hearken unto the voice of, of their, to their voice and make them a king. And Samuel said unto the men of Israel, Go ye every man unto his city. So God says, Go ahead and do it. You know, give them what they want. They'll learn. And when they cry out to me in that day, I won't hear them because I'm warning them right now. You know, and, and the, just the principle there of, of that we need to apply is the fact that. When we're warned, we need to take heed. Because if we've been warned, and then we continue to go on and be in disobedience, there might not be anyone to listen to us when we're, finding, when we're you know, suffering the consequences of sin, of our disobedience. But really what I think this chapter is kind of showing us is the fact that man's system of government always falls short, so falls short of the Lord, his system of government. You know, man has all these ideas about how, how best to run the affairs of man on earth. But they'll always fall short of God's way of doing things. And why is that? Because man is corrupt. You know, there's none righteous. There's none that doeth good. No, not one. 
You know, when you put a sinner in power and you give him all this power and, and, and strength, you know, he's you know he's not going to do good with it. He's going to use it to please himself. You know, the, the the senator who walks into a job that pays six figures and walks out a millionaire. How did he do that? The math's not adding up. You know, taking bribes. You know, being you know the the uh, the, the the lobbyists are coming to him. You know, just I mean, Washington is a corrupt place. You know, they used to say all liars go to hell. What's wrong? They go to Washington. That's where they go, and they get wealthy, and they and they're corrupt, and they're and they're involved, get involved with kinds of things, because man's system of government is terrible, and it falls apart. And I don't care, you know. And we, you know, thankfully in the United States we have one that's at least grants us some freedoms. You know, for me to be able to get up and say what I want to say and still carry guns. Amen? Amen. Right? I mean, I'm saying it could be a lot worse than what we have in here in this country right now, of course. Right. But even in, in, in this government that we have, you tell me it's not corrupt, you tell me there aren't people that are taking advantage to please themselves, that there aren't wicked elements at work in our, in our society. Of course there is. Anyone with a brain can see that. Because man is corrupt, and even in the best of circumstances, he is going to rebel against the Lord. And if you would, go to one more place. Go to Revelation chapter 19. Revelation chapter 19, we'll see this. I think that's one of the great lessons of the millennium. Is that even in the best of circumstances, when the Lord himself is reigning upon the earth, when, when justice is dealt swiftly and executed quickly, and it's righteous judgment, it's a rod of iron, and there's peace or else, even then, man is going to corrupt himself. Man, the heart of man, mankind, is corrupt and just is always wanting to rebel against God. I think that's one of the great lessons we learn in, in, the, in the millennium. Because look here, Revelation 19, look at verse 7. And when a thousand years are expired, so at the end of the millennium, and Satan shall be loosed out of his prison. So you have to remember what's just taking place. A thousand years with the Lord Jesus Christ reigning. And, and, and earth is, you know, is just fruitful. The people are, are flourishing. It's, it's a perfect system. You know, there's, not, there's, there's no corruption in Christ's reign. There's no one sneaking in and, and taking bribes and things like that. That's not happening. But even in the best of circumstances, Satan shall be loosed out of his prison. Look at verse 8. And shall go out and deceive the nations which are the four quarters of the earth. How can, now, how is that possible that he could just go out and deceive these nations that quick? It's because they want to be deceived. Right. They will not have that man to rule over us. They're tired of it. They're tired of all the righteousness and the holiness. You know, we can't march anymore up and down the streets with our gay pride, our sag flag. We want that back. You know, these people are still going to have, there's still going to be sinners in the millennium, folks. Still wanting to do sinful things, except they won't be able to do it. Because it'll be, you know, it's going to be their neck. In many cases, some of the things they're getting away, away with today won't be tolerated. That's what's coming. But so they know all this for a thousand years. It's been like this, and they're just like the sulking kid in the corner, just waiting. You know, oh, I can't wait to get back. You know, just just, just counting down the days so they can just get back at the Lord. And Satan is. I mean, how else do you explain him being able to just go out and just like that, just deceive the nations, just in a moment, just go out and deceive and gather them together? It says there. Uh, he sees in the four quarters of the earth Gog and Magog and gather them together to battle to the point where they're thinking well we can take God on we can we could probably defeat him the number of whom is as the sand of the sea it's a lot of people that are just deceived and they went up upon the breadth of the earth and compassed the camp of the saints about and the beloved city and you know and it, and it turned into this hundred year war or it's just back and forth. God's losing battles, and then he's winning a few, and it's the battle of the bulge, and you know, it just was dragged on. Is that what happens? Nope. It ends like that. And fire came down from God out of heaven and devoured them. The end. And that's that's a pretty swift, swift battle. And they understand who it is they're going up against. But what this shows us is that even in the best of circumstances, like the millennium, man is just hellbent on rebellion. And we see it all the way back in Samuel's day. There, we're done with this judges business. You know, enough of that. We've been doing that for generations, and it never works out. And well, it's not because of us, clearly, because you know we're such saints, us Israelites. 
You know, it's, it's, it's the man of God. It's his fault. It's God's system. It's his fault. Get us a king in here, then we'll do better. That's not what happens at all. And, you know, you can apply that principle to a government. You can apply that to a church. You can apply that to a family. You can apply it to a man of God. That no government, no human government, no church, no family, no man of God is going to be perfect. So what we need to do is be like Samuel and have some real spirituality about us. You know, and pray for the ability to be like Samuel, to judge and discern and have wisdom according to God's word. Let's go ahead and pray.